So when I when I got up this morning, I was so nervous. You know what I mean? I, I just you know because it's hard for me to really relay the gratitude that I have in my life. You know, sometimes you know when we talk about you know or I talk about the things that I've accomplished from being sober, I, feel, I almost feel like I'm bragging, but it's not true. I mean, you know, when I really think about it, you're looking at a miracle. You know, because I was so far down in my life. You know what I mean? By the time I came to AA, I was 37 years old. I had absolutely nothing in my life. I lost everything. You know, and my brother, my oldest brother, had this little club. It was a, it was a shithole. I lived in this club for six years. I had no shower. You know, I used to wash my hair in the sink and, and uh, you know, and, and I was living like an animal. And, and to be quite honest with you, that was okay with me. That's how sick that I became, you know? During that course of time, I, I went to a ton of rehabs. I'm, I'm not a first time winner in this program. You know, I struggled for a long, long time to get sober. I really did, you know? I remember going to my very first AA meeting in 1986. A friend of ours, uh, uh, Bobby Linder, took me to a meeting in Hamilton Township. I just got caught drunk driving. I was 24, 25 years old. That was my first drunk driving. My brother Donnie sitting here came and got me out of jail the next morning. And really, that was the beginning. That was the beginning of my real story in AA and how AA became a part of not only my life, but my family's life. You know what I mean? You know, and I went to my very first meeting, and you know, I, I didn't want to go. You know what I mean? I wasn't done drinking, and I wasn't drunk, done having a good time, and all that other stuff. But I went. But I remember back, that was the first time that I had an intervention in my life, where everybody was there, and, and they were talking about my drinking, you know, and my drugging. You know, they were the first time that they really talked about, hey, you know, maybe this, something's not right with this kid. You know what I mean? Something's going on here. Every single time I picked up a drink or a drug, something bad happened. You know what I mean? Every single time. Nothing, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't pick up a drink or a drug that something bad didn't happen to me. You know? For the next 13 years, I bounced around and I accomplished absolutely nothing in my life. You know, uh, by this time I was 37 years old. I had no job. I had no car. I had no money, I had no place to live, I was homeless, you know what I mean? And um, I was just, you know, I was at the end, really. I didn't know what to do. I, I, I just figured, really, I figured I was going to die an alcoholic. You know what I mean? I was going to be that guy they were going to find one day in the club just dead, you know? I don't know, something happened. I, I, I had this, this light go off in my brain and... Um, you know, it was January of 1999, it was very, very cold outside, and my brother, who was, who was a good enabler for me, finally had enough with me. He says, that's it. I can't do it no more. I can't watch you kill yourself. You know what I mean? I want you to get out of this club, get out of my life, leave your mother, your sister, your brothers alone. Don't come around until you get some help. You know, and for the first time, I knew he meant it. You know, it was the first time I knew he meant what he said. You see, and you know, I, you know, I was sick, but I, you know, I wasn't that stupid either. You know what I mean? I, I you know, I, I didn't have no money, and I couldn't get into a rehab, so I went to the crisis center. And I went over there, and I told him the, the story how I was suicidal, and you know, uh, you know, I was gonna go in front of a train track, and well, anyway, they let me in that place. You know, and I stood there for ten days. You know what I mean? And the course of them 10 days, I had a, a, like an epiphany. You know, the light went off in my, you know, I didn't feel like getting high anymore after all them years. I, you know, I remember on the 10th day I called up and back when I got sober at the rehabs, uh, the halfway houses were just starting in Trenton. There was only one halfway house in Trenton at the time. You know what I mean? And I was lucky enough before I went into that place to call them up and to ask them, if they had a bed for me. So I had a place to go when I got out. You know, and um, you know, they said, yeah. So I got out that day. You know, uh, uh, January 19th was the day I got out. 
You know what I mean? And I swore to God I wasn't going to get high that day. And I just wanted to go into that, um, into that halfway house. But you know, good intentions sometimes don't work. And that day I went out and I got high. You know what I mean? Against everything that was against me, I went out and I got high again. You know what I mean? And I went to that halfway house and I tried to fool people that I wasn't high. They knew. You know what I mean? You know, people know. You know, and their rules were at that time, if you got high, you had to leave. You know, and you know, I didn't have nowhere to go. Well, something happened that they gave me a chance. You know, somebody stepped in and they gave me a chance there. You know, and from that day on, I didn't get high in that halfway house. I spent three and a half years in a halfway house. And you know, and I didn't drink or drug while I was there. And in the course of them three and a half years, I accumulated so much wreckage in my life that I thought it was impossible for me to get my life in order. You know, I had five or six active warrants. Every time I walked out of that house to walk to a meeting, I figured the cops were going to get me and lock me up. And, you know, nobody was going to get me out, and I was a coward. You know what I mean? I, I didn't want to go to jail, you know? But I was scared, and, you know, and. And I just kept walking to meetings and, you know, God prevailed for me and he kept me safe and, you know, I was behind on my child support payments and I didn't have a license for 11 years, you know, and I would go to school to be a bricklayer and work in the union and, you know, I made a good pay and by the time I got done with that, they didn't want nothing to do with me. I think I'm the first guy ever to get thrown out, you know what I mean, because not only wasn't that safe for me, I became a hazard for the workers around me. So they asked me to leave. And thank God they did that. You know? So, you know, while I was in this halfway house, you know, I started to clean up some of my wreckage. You know, I needed help. You know, there were people there that helped me. When I, when I first got there, I didn't have a job, so my brother and my mother had this little restaurant, very small. My brother let me come up there and work for him. I, I was a dishwasher. I made $110 a week. My rent was $105 a week. On Friday, my brother would take the money and go to the halfway house and pay for my rent because he couldn't trust me. And he was right. You know what I mean? And I had $5 a week to spend. My brother says, you know what? He says, you got a roof over your head, and if you need something to eat, you can always call me. So I didn't have that temptation by having that money in my pocket because I probably would have used you know what I mean? You know, and, and, and I got involved in AA, you know, and I got a home group. Like everybody else, I got a home group, and I got a sponsor, you know what I mean? And I began to work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and I started to clean up the wreckage of my past. You know what I mean? I, I had two drunk driving convictions, and I owed $17,000 in fines. You know, I owed... I don't know, another six, seven thousand dollars in court fines and I had five or six active warrants. You know what I mean? I was behind on my child support payment. You know, and and uh, you know, it was just like insurmountable when you when I really looked at it. There was this old guy in Trenton, you know, and I used to go to him and I used to say, Bobby, how the hell is not drinking gonna help me solve these problems? And he would say to me, Frank, he says, just don't drink and go to meetings. You know what I mean? Your life is going to be fine. I said, this guy's crazy. He's nuts, this guy. He says, you know what I mean? He's crazy. You know? I didn't drink and I went to meetings and I can tell you today, all that stuff that I had is all behind me. You know, I, I have a license today, a legal license, and I don't have any warrants. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I remember the last day I went up to pay my last child support payment. I went in front of the judge and he was looking at a piece of paper and I paid, you know, so much money and he says to me, you don't know any money here, Mr. Wonko. You know, and I says, no, this is my last payment today. You know, and this is from a guy that would spend his last five dollars on drugs. You know what I mean? He would spend his last three dollars on whatever he could get. You know? I was so far down the totem pole that I thought it was really impossible for me to change my life. I really believed that. You know what I mean? 
You know, I knew that Alcoholics Anonymous was, work, was working for people. I had friends that were in AA that were changing their lives. But I didn't think, you know, it would work for me. I always thought I was unique, you know what I mean, and different, and that, you know, that it wouldn't work for me. But when I got honest with myself and got involved with Alcoholics Anonymous <coughs> and started to do the things that people told me to do, my life began to change. You know what I mean? And, and I remember I was around a year sober and I was going to court, you know, for all them warrants. The judge was bringing me back once a month to see if I was still staying sober and in the halfway house, you know. And it was around Christmas time and it was Judge Garcia. I'll never forget it. It was like yesterday. And there was nobody in the court but me. I said, what's going on here? The judge came in. She says, Mr. Longo, I want you to come up to the front. I says, okay. She says to me, Mr. Wong, we have a problem today. I said, Your Honor, I said, I've been complying to whatever you told me to comply to. You know what I mean? She says, every once in a while we get a person like you that comes by and we watch what you do and we see that you've been changing your life and this court's going to be real sad to see you go. <laughs> and I stood there and, 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 I, and I stood there and I, and I, and I you know, I, I didn't know what to do. I turned this way, I turned that way, and I figured somebody was going to lock me up, like, you know. And, and I walked out of that courtroom and that was my spiritual awakening. I knew from that day on that I could change my life, that I wasn't different from anybody else, you know. And from that day on, my life has just got continually better. You know, today I'm married, I have two children, I have three children. I have one child that's in rehab. She has the same disease that I have. You know, I was talking with her today a little bit, and we were talking about the big book, and, and I was telling her to read the acceptance of, you know, acceptance thing, and I'm just shaking my head, you know, because it's just, you know, this is not supposed to be. You know, this wasn't supposed to turn out this way. You know, I, I was 37 when I got here. I, I mean, I was damaged goods. You know what I mean? Nobody wanted nothing to do with me. They see me coming, they went on the other side of the street. You know what I mean? They figured I was going to ask them for money, or I was going to bother, <laughs> you know? And if I called them, or this or that, they were running away from me. And they, guess what? They had a right to do them things, you know? The day I came to this meeting a few weeks ago and I heard the desperation and the pain from you people brought me back to the very beginning of my, my sobriety. And for those of you who don't know, my mother's in the front, she's 86 years old. 86 years old. And if she could talk, she could tell you some stories. You know? But I've been fortunate enough to make my amends to my mom. You know what I mean? And I have one of the most wonderful experiences in my life when I got married that I got to dance with my mother at my wedding. Aww. You know? And I remember, I remember the night of my engagement party when I picked my mother up and she said to me, I was sober about three years, three and a half years at the time, and she said to me, she says, you know, Chick, she says, your father would be proud of you today for the person that you became. You know? And you know what I mean? I, it was just such a surreal moment in my life. You know, I've had my ups and downs in recovery, like everybody else. You know, life doesn't stop because you get sober. You know, and you know, I'm not going to move to the front of the line when my time comes just because I'm sober. You know what I mean? I just try to live my life one day at a time. You know, and I have, I have good days and bad days, you know? But, you know, when I think about them days of living in the club and, and living the way I was living, you know, and, and to where I'm at now in my life, you know, that's why I wanted to tell you people, you can never give up hope. You know, never give up hope on your children. Because, you know, if it can happen for me, it can happen for anybody.